take you on a little brief journey down memory lane. My own first contact with Florida happened about the year 1933. I was just a little kid growing up in a small town in Mississippi during that Great Depression, and we were poor and didn't know it. We had plenty to eat, we just didn't have any money. We had a milk cow and we had chickens and we had a big garden, you know, we grew everything we needed to eat. We all did little family jobs, you know, and saved up money, and, and my family job from about the fifth grade on through high school was milking that cow twice a day. She had to be milked at sun up and sun down, no matter, rain, sleet, snow, whatever. And that's one of the main things that motivated me to graduate from high school and leave home and go to college, to get away from that confounded cow. But we did a lot of other things, you know, mowing yards and Finally, we saved up $100. And in the year 1933, we set out on a three-week trip to see the state of Florida. Now, that doesn't sound like much money, does it? $100 to spend three weeks in Florida? That wouldn't get you by one day and one night now. But you know we made it. Back then, there was no such thing as a motel. There were no holiday inns. And and Ramada Inns and Best Westerns. Instead, they had these things called tourist courts. They were little wooden cabins. They rented from $1.50 to $2.50 a night. And inside each one of them, there was some kind of a little cook stove and a table and a few chairs. I don't think we ate five meals in restaurants the whole time we were in Florida. Back then, the roads in Florida, I say roads, there were no highways in Florida in 1933. But the roads were lined solid with things like papayas, guavas, mangoes, and avocados. If you wanted some to eat, you parked the car, you got out, and you helped yourself. Back then, too, the streams that ran along the roads in Florida were so clean and so filled with fish. If you wanted fish for lunch or dinner, you parked the car, caught a grasshopper, put it on a hook, threw it in, and jerked out whatever you wanted to eat. Also, there were no signs like you see today at some of these big corporate grows, hosted, keep out. Nobody cared if you walked out into an orange grove and picked just a few oranges to eat. We started this trip in Pensacola. South of Pensacola, we found a beautiful inlet. The fishing was real good, but we couldn't spend the night there because there was no tourist court. There was one little country store there that sold fish bait and canned goods and things like that, and the people that owned the store lived in the back of the store. And the name of that place was Destin. Traveling south from there, we passed mile after mile after mile of totally uninhabited beach with sand so white it looked like powdered sugar. It was nothing back then to drive 40, 50, even 60 miles along a Florida beach and not see one sign of civilization. Drove into St. Petersburg at a time when shuffleboard courts outnumbered people. Kept driving south, and when we drove into Fort Myers and saw those stately royal palm trees, I couldn't understand why they didn't have coconuts. I thought that all Florida palm trees grew coconuts. South of there, we came to a big place, a village that had a population of about 400 people. It was a fishing village. We spent the night there, and it was called Naples. Traveling south of there on the old Tamiami Trail, when we entered that big cypress swamp for a little kid like myself who had grown up in those rolling pine hills of South Mississippi, it was like leaving this earth 
and going to another planet. It was the most beautiful, most exotic place I had ever seen. I saw things there that I had not only never seen, but had never heard of, like a lancewood tree and a gumbo limbo tree, giant strangler figs, cocoa plum bushes, and those bald cypress trees with limbs covered with hundreds of wild orchids. Back home we had the cypress trees, but we didn't have the hundreds of wild orchids. And it was nothing back then to see a native Florida panther across the road in front of you. And he was in no hurry because he was in no danger. We were chugging along 10 miles an hour because the radiator in that old Ford was constantly boiling over. And the old panther would sit there in the road and watch us coming. If we got too close, he'd trot off and squat again. And then he'd get tired of that and disappear into the smoke. Then all of a sudden, we left that swamp and entered the Florida Everglades. Vast, endless stretches of sawgrass dotted with those little island hammocks of hardwood and cabbage palm. And when we passed through that area, sometimes the flights of birds overhead were so thick, they actually blocked out the sun and cast shadows across the land. Kept going south and found a little village and I saw the first concrete swimming pool I had ever seen in my lifetime. Back home a swimming pool was a nearby creek or a river. But this thing was made out of honest goodness concrete and stone. And it had a diving board and a slide and we had so much fun in that swimming pool, we spent two days there instead of one. And the name of that little village was Carl Gables. And the name of that pool was the Venetian Pool. It's still there today. Went through Miami, went over to Miami Beach, drove up what became Collins Avenue at a time when you could actually see the ocean from the street. Today, you can't. Much of Collins Avenue is a concrete canyon. But back then, you could not only see the ocean, you could park anywhere you wanted to park, get out, and frolic in the sand. Came on up the East Coast, got up to West Palm Beach, and we drove over to Palm Beach. And when we started up Worth Avenue and saw all those expensive shops and all those chauffeur-driven limousines, we knew instantly we were in the wrong place. So we beat a real hasty retreat back over to West Palm Beach. Came on up and spent a night in Fort Pierce and north of there we found a beautiful little seaside village, had a seaside population of about 30 people. Went swimming and I found a starfish. First one I'd ever seen and I thought it was a baby octopus. And I captured that thing and put it in a bucket carried it back to Mississippi so all my friends could see my baby Florida octopus. And the name of that little village was Vero Beach. Came on up and spent the night in another one, population of about 30 people too, called Cocoa Beach. Then up north of there, another little place we stayed on the seaside population, no more than 30, 35 people, New Smyrna Beach. Except back then it wasn't called New Smyrna Beach. It was called Coronado Beach. Went on up and saw the historical sites in St. Augustine up to Jacksonville. In Jacksonville, we turned around, came back, crossed the St. Johns River to Palatka. And from Palatka down through the scrub country to Silver Springs. Silver Springs back then was the number one tourist attraction in the state of Florida. Everyone who came to Florida wanted to see Silver Springs. And back then it was a fairyland. It was one of the most beautiful, exotic places you can imagine. From there we went into Ocala. Ocala to Gainesville, Gainesville to Newberry, Newberry to Perry, and then to Tallahassee. And to Tallahassee took the old Spanish trail, old Highway 90, 
back to Pensacola and then home. But those are some of my memories of a Florida that once was, is no more, and never again will be.